A few announcements. The herbarium talk tomorrow, uh, or I'm sorry, Friday, uh, April 22nd at 1230, the herbarium talk is Kirsten Fisher, uh, the professor and chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at Cal State LA. I don't have the title for that. Essig brunch also on Friday at 10. Brian White uh, from Neil Tsutsui's lab is speaking on social recognition using behavioral assays and chemical analyses. It's a finishing talk. Uh, Herp group uh, Monday at 6.30 is Ann Chambers, uh, tentatively hosted in person at Becca Harvey's house. Becca, are you here? Jim, you heard anything about this? That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> All right. uh, very good. And then uh, today, uh, the CCB seminar is one that uh, is likely to be of interest to those uh, interested in evolutionary genetics. It's Jonathan Pritchard from Stanford University. That's at 3 p.m. in 125 uh, Lee Kashin. And the title is Polygenic Adaptation Something Something. <laughs> um, what day is that? That's today. Uh, today in Lee Kashin at 3 p.m. And he's a, he's a great speaker, so I encourage you. Uh, next week, Shannon O'Brien uh, is giving MBZ lunch. Uh, so today marks the third of four finishing talks in as many weeks, and one, which is fantastic. I'll, I'll, I'll just note there's a, a strong gender bias uh, among these, these four. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's great. But for all of the male uh, graduates <laughs> who are in their sixth year, <laughs> especially, time to finish up. <laughs> all right. Um, the MBZ retreat is Monday, uh, May 2nd. I think most people are signed up. Uh, that's an all day affair. Uh, with a social uh, happy hour at the end. So it's going to be a lot of silence and, and uh, some time for hanging out. Uh, and I think that's all I have in the way of announcements. Are there other uh, announcements? If not, I will turn it over to our resident ichthyologist and who is today's speaker. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure today. I'm, I'm humbled to honor to uh, honor and introduce Emily Richards. So Emily grew up in Idaho. And then for her undergrad, she said, you know what? I'm going to Hawaii. So she did her undergrad at, at University of Hawaii in Manoa, and then her master's degree there as well. Originally, she was planning to work on fish. She's an avid scuba diver. She's always been a fish person. She was gonna work on parrot fish with Dave Carlin. And I think a year into your master's degree, he moved across the country, which is a common theme with her graduate advisor. <laughs> so she switched over into Bob Thompson's lab, um, doing her master's thesis before joining my lab in 2016 when we were at UNC. Um, and then three years at UNC before we moved here in 2019, where she's been here for another three years, mostly through the pandemic. Emily's already has a postdoc lined up. Her first choice, who is Suzanne Mago at University of Minnesota. So she's now going back to the cold that she grew up with. Um, and, and I mean, with Emily, I want to just emphasize, just she makes it look so easy and, and just loves science, has a passion for science, and just everything that she attempts, she accomplishes with ease and grace. And you never realize, especially as a new PI. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, she's on 13 publications. Five of those are first author. She published her master's thesis in systematic biology, um, then went on to publish four of her chapters already as first author. She has a fifth chapter that's in revision at Proceedings of Royal Society. Her first chapter in plus genetics has been cited 90 times. And for us, you know, that's that's a lot in published land, in my view. Um, and she's also published in Evolution Letters and Proceedings of Academy of Sciences. These are not easy journals to publish in. Emily is a rock star. Um, and just to go back to the beginning, I think I have a couple slides here. <laughs> yeah, so note the date. So September 4th, 2015, I started my lab at UNC July 1st, 
in 2015. So Emily was the fir very first prospective grad student to write to me to join the lab. That, and so from my perspective, it looked like, look how easy this was, right? It was like, first student writes, and it's like, oh yeah, slam dunk. And I just want to point out, just in her very first email, um, she describes her master's thesis project with just casually, right? I'm doing this by testing how well posterior predictive tests of model performance are able to detect bias phylogenetic inferences by comparing topological incongruence among individual mitochondrial gene trees. The results of these tests, right? No problem. <laughs> Which was, you know, this wasn't just stringing words together. This is an excellent summary of her master's thesis. And you could make one more slide. And the best then is also my response. This is the way I used to recruit. Uh, UNC is a great group of biologists, and having just moved from Berkeley, I still can't get over how easy and affordable everything is here in the triangle. <laughs> that came back to bite us, didn't it? Affordable housing is better. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, okay, one more. <laughs> um, so I'll just start with the field work. So this is Emily's first time in San Salvador Island, and one of our very first days in the field, I mean, we went to this hellscape, right? It's like 100 degrees out there. You have to wear a full suit, a wetsuit, right, to keep off the stinging anemones. And we've been hauling seine nets like all day long and just like the blistering sun, one inch visibility. And Emily, you know, casually walking back with a smile on her face. So this is Emily in the field. She's fantastic. Emily as a teacher. Um, I should point out that she um, was a TA, a GSI at UNC for this course that I didn't teach, but other faculty taught. And she actually ended up teaching two courses at the same time, two four-hour labs. That always impressed me. <laughs> and again, she did it with grace and ease, where it was this sort of a course based on undergraduate research experience. And Emily was just like running back and forth between two classrooms that were running PCR tests simultaneously. I don't know how you did that. Um, she's also been really active with the DEI welcoming committee. She's been active with expanding your horizons, so inspiring young women and girls to pursue careers in science, where she's designed with Michelle and I think Jackie as well sometimes, right? These pupfish-based uh, lesson plans. Um, she also mentored an REU student last summer and summers before that. She's mentored many undergrads. I should mention, I'll let her research speak for, for itself. Um, on the fish side of the lab, the fish breeding side, she's also a master pupfish breeder. So, which you probably won't see much about today, but over the last three years, so from UNC across the country to most of the pandemic, Emily raised not one F2 QCL mapping cross, but five <laughs> simultaneously, where she learned how to pick eggs and, and just master that as well. And finally, she's cultivated a, an incredible professional network. So winning over Daniel Matute early on in her career, who's one of her staunchest supporters, um, seamlessly joining Priya Morgani's lab group here. She's been invited already to give presentations at Duke, um, as well as Montpellier, as well as this summer, she's head co-lining a session where she was invited to speak alongside Ole Seehausen at the European Society of Evolutionary Biology meetings. Um, so she, she's fantastic, right? And I should stop gushing. <laughs> All right, and finally, uh, let's see, one more. Um, yeah, my favorite woman in the field. So uh, one of my favorite moments, this is Emily skeptically staring. This is in North Carolina, one of the first times our lab did field work catching pupfish here. This is right where we just saw an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe just got out of there. <laughs> and Emily said, I'm still in the water. <laughs> and Emily's skeptically looking at right where the alligator was. <laughs> All right, take it away, Emily. I'm looking forward to your talk. <laughs> you guys don't mind. I'm going to have to process a lot of that later. <laughs> never get done. Um, but also a common theme amongst pictures I even have my own talk is that I'm always standing watching other people. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, okay. So yeah, so today I just wanted to share with you a couple stories from um, my PhD. And uh, first, I just wanted to say that I really love hybridization and I'm so fascinated by it. And I'm not alone in these halls in that fascination. 
So for example, um, Alden Miller, our second director of the MBD, um, has a whole entire paper in the journal Condor written about a single hybrid specimen. Um, so he was really excited about the mosaic of traits that it has, and he's taken a, too many pictures of this one bird. But um, one of my favorite things about this is that his description of where he happened upon that bird. Change it? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to read you a quote. So it was with decided interest and not without doubts that I responded to an invitation of Mr. Charles G. Thompson to verify the characters of a crown sparrow feeding about his yard that he said he showed features of both species. So he was really doubtful when he went over there, but then got super excited by it. Um, and you can tell he was so excited because although Mr. Thompson was much interested in watching the bird about his place, he ascended to its capture alive for the purposes of close study. <laughs> And so um, I think Mr. Thompson learned a valuable lesson today that you shouldn't really invite biologists to your backyard <laughs> because they're going to take your birds away from you in the name of science. <laughs> but this early fascination, um, I think, is stemming just from the novelty surrounding these sort of hybrid individuals. Um, back then, we didn't really think that um, there was a lot of hybrids happening between animals in particular. But these days, we know that they're quite commonplace in nature. And um, things like hybrid zones um, are really well documented and all over the place. So this particular hybrid zone is the very first time I experienced hybrids. Um, and it was in my kind of introductory biology textbook. Um, and it's the hybrid zone between the, the fire-bellied and the yellow-bellied toad. Um, and these sorts of kind of hybrid zones have really shown us that those really interesting um, mosaics of traits that um, Alden was really interested in do have a lot of kind of interactions with, say, the environment. And hybridization has a really big impact on evolution, and it can tell us a lot about what happens when major forces of evolution collide. And so um, this is not the only kind of outcome that comes from um, hybridization. There's a really wide array of them. Um, and one I just want to focus on a little bit is one that's much more subtle than, say, the kind of hybrid over there is, and that's through um, adaptive integration. So you can actually get from hybridization um, added trait diversity um, without, say, actual um, hybrids happening. Um, and not, you get hybrids, of course, but like the, uh, eventually the kind of outcome is that it doesn't add a lot of trait diversity, say the hybrids, what it does is add a lot of trait diversity to the original parental species. So here, for example, um, there's been an integration. So integration is just the kind of these two different species will hybridize. Their hybrids will then start back crossing with the parental species. And then then gives, um, say, this house mouse access to parts of the genome from this completely other different species of mouse. And so that's an example of what happened um, in the kind of development of warfarin resistance in house mouse. They actually kind of borrowed it from this other species that was already resistant. And so these sort of generative roles of hybridization um, are really uh, gaining in popularity these days. Um, because they're quite exciting, and mice aren't the only ones out there with evidence of, say, adaptive aggression, um, playing functional roles. Um, and it's springing up all over the place in animals, including this one. So all of us <laughs> running around uh, are running around with some level of Neanderthal ancestry in our genomes, um, and we didn't suspect a thing for decades. Um, so now we're all realizing that genetic exchange with ancient hominins um, may have really had their hand in a lot of um, human adaptations. So um, I, today I just want to share with you some of the work that I've been doing to explore the sort of generative roles hybridization may be playing in a particular adaptive radiation of pupfish. And so today I just want to start by first introducing the system that we're going to focus on and um, use some of their features just to highlight uh, why the origins of adaptive radiations are so mysterious and how much we still don't know about why some lineages will um, diversify into a bunch of new species and others won't. So adaptive radiations really draw your eye to the fantastical array of ecological divergence, phenotypic diversity, and species diversity that they kind of create all in really kind of rapid evolutionary or on really short rapid evolutionary time scales. Um, and not only do they create a lot of diversity within them, but a lot of variation among radiations along these axes as well. But the things that we think they have in common are they occur with lineages um, have, you can respond to the sort of open ecological opportunities, say there's an unoccupied island um, that they colonize, 
and that they have enough genetic variation to be able to respond to that ecological opportunity and diversify into a bunch of new species. And that's basically it, um, which seems a little bit absurd for kind of the fantastical things that are going on in adaptive radiation, um, that you just have enough um, ecological, there's some ecological opportunity, you have enough genetic variation, and that explains why some lineages will diversify into new species on an island while others won't. And a radiation that I think exemplifies this sort of um, uh, insufficiency of this answer is in Cyprin on pupfish. So these fish exist all across the um, sort of like north coast of the US, not north coast, east coast of the US, <laughs> down through the Caribbean and into Venezuela. Um, and they all generally look like this. So they're generalist, um, just snacking on like algae and detritus mainly. Um, and they are usually just like single allopatric species um, of pupfish in ponds throughout that range. Mm -hmm. Except we're going to take a trip to the Bahamas today. Um, and uh, visit this particular island, San Salvador Island, which is our ultimate uh, escape for pupfish. Um, so this is the kind of fun little Wendy's bar that you see right outside the airport. Um, but we're going to see Lundy later and we're going to actually take a trip to the northeast side of the island or yeah northeast side of the island um, and visit the research station there grab some buckets and head inland so bye bye pretty beaches and what we're going to do is happen upon this um, all-inclusive pupfish resort and so what we're going to do is jump into this pond and we're going to see those grazing generalist pupfish that we expect. So they're just the standard pupfish across the Caribbean and they're just swimming around, nibbling on algae. Except for if we spend enough time there, we're going to notice some different pupfish there as well. So there's a molluscivore pupfish. Um, and Michelle showed us that they don't um, crush their kind of hard shelled prey. What they actually do is pry them out by vigorously shaking them about. And we think that novel nasal protrusion might play a role. Um, that you can see up here. And then last but not least, what we have is our scalating pupfish. Um, so it's using these really large um, and large oral jaws that we see up here to um, ambush its uh, fellow pupfish and rip scales off of them. So here's our scale eater, very well camouflaged. It's gonna turn and look at us and you're getting kind of scared. You're like me. <laughs> You know, um, so it just is kind of a, an annoying, annoying friend to have in the lake, but um, <laughs> it's just eating your scales. So now these two specialists, that molluscivore that I just showed you in the scale eater, only exist on this island. So that's despite there being generalist populations basically across um, all of the Caribbean that are living in very similar ponds with very similar communities. And they have lots of scales and snails that these pupfish could eat. And so besides these really weird and fun um, specializations, my favorite uh, part about this radiation is just that there are so many kind of generalist only populations out there that didn't radiate in the same sort of ecological opportunity. So they have very similar lakes. They all have very similar biological com communities, no differences in predators or anything like that. Um, but we only see generalists out there um, usually except for this one island. And so already our recipe is failing us a little bit. Um, we don't see much difference in that ecological opportunity um, that we might expect that would explain why they diversified on one island and not another. And so this leads us into the question of, well, maybe San Salvador Island itself um, doesn't have any differences in ecological opportunity, but the kind of lineage of pupfish that landed there has something going on different in its gen genome. So it might have, say, more genetic diversity um, in that initial colonizing population. And so one of the first things um, I did with a, a lot of help from other people is um, kind of round up 200 genomes from across Cyprinon's range, um, several generous populations spanning from North Carolina down through a couple um, uh, islands in the Bahamas, like New Providence and Run Key. Um, and then into the Dominican Republic and then Venezuela, as well as obviously uh, uh, radiating lineages. And so one of the first things after I got these sequences back was just try to ask, well, on a genome-wide level, do we see more genetic diversity in our radiation? And so 
Here's just a plot of within population nucleotide diversity, chi, on the y-axis, and our kind of different populations on the x, with our radiation on this side, and our generalist populations um, over here in the circles. And so what you can kind of see is that, yeah, there's some differences sometimes. So these are just like an uh, average, um, those kind of summary stats. There are some differences going on, but they don't seem to be extremely drastic. Um, so it was kind of a letdown right there, but maybe this overall higher genetic diversity that I was first looking for isn't actually what's important here. Uh, maybe it's just that to be those kind of specialists, you only need a lot of genetic diversity in the right regions of your genome. Um, so these genome-wide um, looks won't tell us anything. So next, what I did was just extract a set of candidate adaptive alleles. Um, for each of the specialists. And those are kind of these alleles that are divergently um, kind of fixed or nearly fixed between the species in the radiation. And they also appear in a region that looks like it's undergone, under, undergone um, directional selection in the form of a hard selective sweep. So we get those kind of uh, set of alleles. And then we ask just, are they out there in the, the rest of those populations um, on other islands that haven't radiated? And surprisingly, the, the answer is a definite yes. So um, what we see is actually that a lot of it is standing genetic variation across the Caribbean, 98% um, of it, in fact. Um, and even nearly half of that standing is actually in this black wedge. It's actually also found in the sort of outgroup to the, the cyprinodon. So it's at least 5 million years old, we think. And um, the radiation itself is only 10 to 20,000 years old. Um, there's a small slice of really unique variation to San Salvador, um, only in the scalator. And um, there's also some evidence that some of this variation may have been integrated um, into their genomes. And so we'll come back to that last little bit um, in the next section, but I just wanted to summarize that pupfish are really highlighting the kind of incompleteness um, of this story um, for adaptive radiations. And so the field as a whole is beginning to sort of start exploring other sort of predictors or explanatory factors um, by looking at what else radiations have in common besides these two things. And so that's gonna lead us into our next part, which is just an idea that um, you could quite quickly gain um, uh, genetic diversity um, at really subtle levels um, uh, in the form of like maybe not just gaining really new mutations, but gaining like new different combinations of the same old alleles out there um, and generate new phenotypes that way and potentially reproductive isolation. Um, and so this idea that perhaps hybridization is bringing in the kinds of genetic variation radiations need um, is quickly gaining popularity in the field. Um, so basically it's also, and why that is, is because it's another common denominator happening. So these are all different examples of radiations in which we found evidence of um, hybridization and integration going on in their genomes. Um, and so people out there, and there's so many, like I can't even put uh, enough citations for everybody on one slide, but um, so many different radiations have this, um, and that includes the pupfish. So we see a really strong um, pattern of admixture um, happening in our radiation, um, particularly one that was really exciting to see, which is um, a, this arrow represents um, an admixture event, and it looked like it involves the base of the radiation. So here's the radiation, and then here's a bunch of outgroup populations. And so we see these signs of admixture involving the radiation and outgroup populations, and that's actually like the gold standard right now in the field for having evidence that hybridization has done something for irradiation. And so this signature was really exciting to see my first few years, um, but we all know that data betrays us. <laughs> and <laughs> what I actually found too was there was other signatures, right? So there's populations um, in the Caribbean that aren't radiating, but also experiencing that mixture. Um, and as I dived into it over the years with kind of additional independent analyses, um, I saw that that pattern was really extensive so this graph looks a little crazy, but that's kind of the whole point. Um, so all of these dash lines are kind of representing um, admixture events that were inferred with this method. Um, and what you'll see is that the radiation is sort of over here. We see that replication of the signature of admixture involving sort of the base of the radiation. 
um, which is cool. Um, but then we also see a lot of other <laughs> arrows on this graph. Um, so it's basically inferring that nearly every single generalist population I have in this data set has experienced admixture in its past. So I think the pupfish now are kind of moving beyond just investigating and documenting hybridization into an area that I find really fascinating, but also challenging, which is just to figure out why exactly hybridization may have played a role in irradiation um, in San Salvador, but not on other places. And so um, one of the first places that we can start is just by looking at um, what has happened after those hybridization events. So maybe there's been more integration of genetic variation into this, the radiating lineages on San Salvador um, than there's been um, following the admixture events on other kind of generalist only islands. And so here's the kind of documenting um, signatures of adaptive integrations. So that's just signatures that look like they've integrated into the specialist um, background but also see signs of those kind of hard selective suites going on in those same regions. And so here is just a lot of just documenting um, quite a few different potential sources of integration from both the north and the south of St. Albert Island. Um, and if we look at it slightly different way, um, what we can do is just put those number of adaptive integration regions on a y-axis with different populations on the x. So here's our specialist that I'm just showing you. Um, and here are those generalist populations. Um, and so what I'm gonna show you is just the number of integration regions that appear in those um, generalist only populations. And it turns out there are some. Um, and the signature is kind of uh, like, I mean, like it's, it's uh, pointing so still towards like, we don't know what exactly um, is happening here with the hybridization. Um, we can see that there's been a little bit more integration it looks like in the specialists. Uh, which does um, lend some support to the idea that hybridization plays a role in the adaptive radiation in the system. Um, but it's just really fascinating to me that we see signs of integration of some of those same regions even um, into uh, the generalist only populations out there. And so leaving that just aside for one second, um, it really does also bring up a question of, well, like, what is that integrase variation doing in the specialist? Um, if it didn't do something in those generalist only populations. And so this is where I got by with a little help from my friends and I handed over <laughs> the knowledge of my integress variants, um, including that list of those candidate adaptive SNPs to use as a net, if you will, um, for my friends to go fishing for some functional, potential functional consequences of the system. So um, various undergraduates like uh, Takao has found some evidence of morphological divergence um, and diversity in those generalist only populations, they do exhibit some diversity in phenotypes that seem relevant for our radiation, like slightly enlarged jaws. Um, so it kind of is an exciting result just to see on a phenotype level that they do contain um, phenotypic diversity and that integration of their genetic variation might be useful. Michelle also found that integrase variation kind of frequently lie in some of her craniofacial PTL and backing up and supporting that some of that um, morphological diversity and genetic diversity from out in the Caribbean might help with these kind of craniofacial traits. And then Austin has also found some evidence um, of kind of consequent fitness consequences of these integrase variation, and they might actually help make um, traveling that fitness landscape that we see in the radiation easier. And so um, you should definitely, if you haven't, um, Michelle and Austin have both had their own MVD talks and talked about these subjects. And then Austin's paper was just accepted in Eli. Um, so definitely go check out their work too. But this talk is about me, so we're gonna skip that. <laughs> we're gonna skip that. Um, yeah. yes. <laughs> and so I think Puffish are really highlighting how adaptive radiation might be hard to do alone. Um, and hybridization can really be useful um, for creating that really rapid burst of phenotypes and say genotypes um, that you might want to be able to diversify um, along uh, in response to ecological opportunity. And so um, we're gonna leave that story there. Um, and I'm really excited to try to continue looking at maybe why those um, generalist only pupfish haven't responded to what seems like very similar histories of hybridization in the same way as the kind of radiating lineage does. So I think it'll reveal even like, um, uh, it'll reveal other predictors we could use to kind of uh, 
excuse me, define or like uh, explore a bit more the origins of adaptive radiations. But um, another aspect of my PhD research has actually been diving into like a little deeper in focus and exploring sort of the genetic transition that's happening between um, generalists to scale leaders. So looking at the genetics underlying that evolutionary novelty in our system. And um, what I want to say is just that the, the main identifier we've been using so far um, for novelty is basically that it's rare and fantastical. Um, such as scalating, which is a really rare ecological niche. Um, and it looks like it's very complicated because it involves a lot of behavioral changes and morphological changes. Um, and you should definitely check out Michelle's talk for um, seeing how complex this particular evolutionary novelty actually is. Um, but as a field, we don't really know mechanistically how exactly we make those kind of novel transitions um, uh, on like a microevolutionary scale. So we literally have to see novelty to know it is even there, um, which doesn't make um, sort of predicting when it's going to arise in the future um, possible. And so that capacity to be able to predict something is actually really useful um, in evolutionary biology because it lets us know that we know enough about a process um, if we can sort of be able to predict when we might see it. And so I don't know, I don't want to set you up thinking that I found out how to predict evolutionary novelty. Um, it's only man. <laughs> but, but what I want to do is just sort of uh, talk or explore with you sort of one of the microevolutionary processes that might be um, involved in these kind of major ecological transitions that underlie a lot of novelties. So um, one hypothesis out there of why novelty is so rare um, is that uh, it's a strongly mutation limited process on the genetic level. So we're thinking that those novel ecological transitions are rare because the wait time for these sort of uh, new mutations um, that will cause these novel phenotypes that let you say occupy a novel ecological niche um, is a, takes a really long time. And let alone um, the mutation rate being kind of low and slow to get mutations, let alone having one that actually is beneficial in the environment you're in. Um, will take a really long time. So it doesn't actually have to be just a single mutation that you're waiting for. It could be that they could think of it as like a large genetic influx um, of mutations, say after like a hybridization event. And so um, one of the resulting patterns that you might see from a mutation limited process is that you see um, sort of the arisal, arising of whatever that word is, the presence of the allele um, being first present. And then it's basically because what we're waiting for is these alleles, um, selection happens really uh, quickly on them and our novel traits arise. And this could be like after a big environmental shift where all these alleles are now beneficial. Uh, but this kind of uh, diagram that I'm just depicting is about um, say like a hybridization event bringing in a bunch of new mutations. And so these are on the, the X axis are alleles that are artfully arranged into a special message for you guys. <laughs> and then um, the, basically the uh, age of say of the allele is in, from the past to the top to the present. So we see a really strong um, tie between when they arise and when they fix. Um, another idea out there um, might be that these kind of novel ecological transitions are so rare because they really are dependent on not the sort of just like having a new mutation, but um, the order in which those mutations end up getting fixed. Um, and so you might actually need a lot of genetic mutations to rise to high frequency to set the stage for any new mutations that kind of help you gain that novel trait, let's say the, the noses on our molluscomore cupfish, um, before those actual mutations can be beneficial. So for example, one thing that this might look like um, in comparison to this one is that you can see those alleles arise um, over time. Um, and I've just simplified it and put them all like arising at the same time up here. Um, but you won't actually see the selection on them um, uh, instantly like in our last prediction, um, because actually what's happening is that your, your allele over here um, might actually arise really, um, might be actually a really old allele. Um, but it is not beneficial until you get the right set of other alleles fixing in the background. And we're going to call it the genomic background, which is, the, is just a series of alleles that are um, 
interact together to be able to produce a particular trait effect, say like our novelty trait. And so um, novelty might um, be really rare because it's very contingent on getting the right genomic background set up um, to be able to produce your trait. Um, and for that trait to actually kind of, uh, uh, yeah, be adaptive. Um, so what you're gonna do is just have that really long wait time for novelty, not because you're waiting for new mutations or say a hybridization event, but because you're waiting for the right genomic background. So one place to start identifying the microevolutionary forces that are happening here um, uh, in our own system is just to start documenting evidence um, from the wild. So I wanted to do this and just see which patterns might hold for the transition from generalist into our ski leader. So in, um, I took an inferential approach because I can't wait around for new mutations to arrive in Popfish. I'm about to finish a PhD. But um, so I took an inferential approach by looking at the timing of selection on alleles that have already um, fixed or nearly fixed between these two species. And um, so I pulled out those alleles um, that look like they're adaptive and fixed. And then what I did was just estimate the timing of selection. Um, and we'll call that like a hard selective sweep using this coalescent based approach called star TMRCA. Um, it's just a fun name because um, in coalescent um, patterns, uh, selective sweeps will leave this kind of starburst where you have your kind of um, current lineages right here that have a copy of that um, sweeping allele. And they all rapidly trace their ancestry back to a single um, ancestral copy. And so basically what I wanted to do was just estimate the timing on um, the alleles that we see fixed between scalators and generalists um, and see which kind of pattern holds. Do we see really concurrent sweeps of a lot of things or do we see that staggered pattern? And so on the x-axis here are just a bunch of um, alleles that have been kind of coded by the gene that they're in or near. Um, not a lot is very important about these um, or if you're interested in, I can talk about it later, but the Red just means that they're actually de novo mutations to a to Salvador Island, and the kind of bold um, means, and the asterisk means that they're kind of been related to um, uh, craniofacial traits in model organisms. And so let's put those timing of selection on there. And so I found that staggered pattern of selection um, in which different alleles have swept at different times. And that's kind of based on these 95% uh, confidence regions, um, not overlapping among. Um, some of them. And that staggered pattern suggests that kind of contingency um, on your genomic background to that mutation order process. And I think it's actually really highlighted by the fact that there's a rather distinct stage of selection on de novo mutations happening really recently um, and in a really short time scale, um, which makes me think that these de novo mutations didn't all arise really recently. So they're not like they arose really fast and then got selected really fast. They've probably been segregating and arising at different times since um, cutfish have hit San Salvador Island about 10 to 20,000 years ago. And then they were probably only um, beneficial until other alleles, potentially these ones, um, swept to fixation first. That are, and those ones are all kind of standing in that variation. And so these signs, um, these signs of these transitions being really contingent on the genomic background highlight how complex um, evolutionary novelty, the transition to evolutionary novelty can be. Um, and it kind of predicts or helps us um, cope with the fact that scalator is so rare, despite there being scales everywhere um, among cutfish, it might just take a really long time to be able to reach scalating from that kind of genetic background standpoint. But I have a confession to make you guys. I've been hiding something you from this entire time. <laughs> and that's the fact that there's another scale eater <laughs> in this radiation. Um, and it's one that we're going to call the wide mouth. And I know it's a very fun name, but it's literally because they have the widest mouth <laughs> of all the cuttlefish. Um, so that's its kind of nickname for now. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, um, how this wide mouth is different from that earlier scale eater I told you about, the spawner, um, more at the MEB symposium. But I first just want to show you them swimming around in the lakes. Um, so they live sympatrically with everyone else, including that bisphometer. They're right here. I know it's super easy to see how wide their mouth is, <laughs> but, but yeah. And so um, I call it the scale eater, a scale eater because we have found evidence 
that they eat scales in the wild. Um, so one of the first things I did here was um, go into our collection of these um, wide mouth individuals and just count the scales in their guts. And so here's our um, disclomer. Um, and that's our more specialized scale eater that I've been talking about this entire time. Um, and you can see that they often have like every single individual has at least one scale in their gut. One of them had 76 and it was annoying to count that one. But, <laughs> but um, the, the generalists here um, have absolutely none. And then these wide mouth individuals are intermediate. Um, so half the individuals did have scales in their gut. Um, and it's that quite different, like it doesn't seem like a lot, but like the generalists and the molluscular often have none at all. Um, so that kind of uh, uh, short term view is reflected on this long term scale too from their muscle tissue. So isotope analyses show that particularly their, um, uh, their delta nitrogen, their T nitrogen up here um, is intermediate between both the generalist and the squalmeter. Um, and that often indicates uh, that they are at an intermediate trophic position between the two. Okay, so we find two scale eaters here. Now, what do they add to our idea that these transitions um, have been really complex at the genetic level? Um, and so I use a very similar approach to what I first used for the scale eater um, disclometer, but this time I'm showing you the variants that are kind of fixed against the generalists for all three specialists. Um, and all I want to point out is that there's absolutely none shared across all three specialists um, at the kind of fixed adaptive candidate alleles level, but there are some shared between our two scale leaders over here. And so um, that's not that unexpected. They do share um, the most common ancestor between the two. Um, and the, the fun, interesting thing to me, though, is that they might have actually diverged from each other quite a while ago. Um, the radiation estimate from my demographic model is about 50,000 um, with the two uh, scale leaders, the wide mouth and the small leader, diverging shortly after that. Um, so this shared ancestry doesn't really make them um, independent transitions to scale eating in the sort of way that we like um, in evolutionary analyses. But I actually think that the shared ancestry makes it a bit easier to um, kind of apples to apples compare those genomic backgrounds. So they are doing a very similar um, Eco, they're occupying a pretty similar ecological niche, and they also have a shared ancestry. So their genomic background should be pretty similar, or at least we could expect that. Um, so I did, with this wide mouth, wide mouth make a very similar um, selective sleep analysis that I just want to show you. So here's that whole plot of both of them across all the adaptive alleles and specialists, um, and to just orient ourselves um, I first want to show the one that we've seen already, which is for dysphometer. And we'll see that this time it's highlighted by the things that they share with the wide mouth and the things that they don't that are unique to them. And so I want to add in those wide mouths now. Um, and just by starting off looking at what they share with that dysphometer. So selection of these same alleles um, do look like that kind of staggered pattern, like there's not a concurrent sweep across all of them. Um, but interestingly, they look like they are selected upon at potentially different times between both of them and also in a different order. Um, so I found that really fascinating that even though they use the same set of alleles, um, the kind of paths that they've taken seem to be really different already. And so the same can be said um, for their unique alleles too. Um, so kind of like the dysphometer, we see this really recent sweep of um, some alleles. Um, but what's really interesting to me here, too, is that I know everything's just <laughs> <laughs> that none of these are actually no mutations. They appear to be interbreast variation um, from a generalist population that's kind of closely related to North Carolina um, and our, in our Carolina sample. And, um, and they don't share that integration um, with this scale leader, so it's unique to them. Um, and so why I think this kind of pattern is really intriguing to me is that um, these novo alleles that are beneficial for our specialized scale leaders um, are, are being actually introduced into the background of the wide mouth. Um, so now that some of these alleles aren't actually fixed between the two of these. So like you'll see like one or two copies running around in the wide mouth. Um, and that's probably because they're living in the same lakes um, and they're really young species. So they're not completely reproductively isolated. And we do know there's gene flow between them. Um, so they they have those kind of alleles available to them, but they're not under selection in the same way that they are in the group of the squamater. 
And you can think of that vice versa for those in address variations. And so what I hope you take away from here is just that despite these failures doing very similar things ecologically, um, they don't have very similar genomic backgrounds. Um, even the alleles that they share seem to be under selection in a different order um, and potentially a different time. And a lot of them actually, uh, most alleles don't seem to be beneficial to both populations. They're only beneficial in one or the other, which implies maybe that there's something going on um, between their divergent backgrounds um, that makes it that way. And so I think this actually ties back to my first chapter that I presented um, about hybridization and it, why exactly it was um, so hard to figure out why maybe similar signs of um, or similar histories of hybridization between different populations um, haven't resulted in the same thing like we might predict for adaptive radiations. Um, and that's just because even among these really closely related species, um, alleles are having very different effects um, in their backgrounds. And so it might not be so surprising that some of the generalist populations out there haven't responded in the same way that say the San Salvador Island population did to the very same genetic variation that they're experiencing. And so um, I think that my PhD's time at work has highlighted basically the creative roles that hybridization might play, yes, but also very much so the kind of tangled path um, still, for, uh, still in front of us towards figuring out why exactly some radiation or some lineages form these radiations and others don't. Um, and I really um, was really intrigued just by the complex interactions that are happening between selection and hybridization. Um, mainly for like, it just seems so complex that maybe I'm not so excited about the complexity, but I'm also really excited about the fact that these sorts of novel transitions and down to radiations are really quite a common feature on macroevolutionary scales, given even though the microevolutionary um, processes underlying them seem to be really complex. And so if any of what I presented to you about um, the, the role of hybridization and adaptive radiation confused you, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Something I'm taking away from my PhD is a better appreciation of being confused. So studying hybridization is really enlightening to the fact that um, um, I often get a sense of confusion when I'm trying to look at something from a singular perspective. Um, and so when I try to tackle a problem with that singular perspective, um, I end up not being able to understand anything and being very confused. And so I think something that really highlights um, or conceptualizes um, this idea is this excellent painting by Salvador Dali called The Endless Enigma. Now, when you first look at this painting, you're like, what? No, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's really frustrating to try to digest. I mean, you immediately start trying to pick apart um, what's in there. So you're like, oh, there's a face somewhere in there. Um, and you can do that, actually. Um, this painting is actually made of individual images that are all presented to you in the same space at the same time. Um, so you can first start being like, okay, I see the greyhound over there. Um, uh, I'm starting to see the greyhound. I'm starting to understand this painting. And oh, I see that it kind of morphs into this reclining philosopher and it all starts to make sense. Um, but when you do that, you're like, again, that face. <laughs> what is that face doing there? Um, and that basically, um, you pick up on the, the moment where you have to make basically irrational connections between things to be able to understand this painting at all. And so um, the multifaceted outcomes of hybridization just really remind me of this painting. Um, and I'm walking away with this sort of saying, like figuring out that I need to sort of accept um, and start working with multiple perspectives about it. Um, so I'm looking really forward to being um, more and more confused by hybridization um, and then also confused by all of your work as well. <laughs> so um, something that you also can't do alone is a PhD. And so it's that time for acknowledgements. Um, and so first I just wanna say thank you to all of you um, for listening. And then also to all these wonderful people who have helped with um, various aspects of my PhD, also my committee up here for all of their help, uh, full comments about um, not only this stage, but also the postdoc stage of life. And from that, I wanna start with my thanking my family. And also if you have to go, I'm not exactly sure what time it is, but you don't have to go, oh, feel free. Um, and I want to just thank my family for um, supporting me for all these years that I've been chasing my goal to be a scientist. Um, they've had absolutely no frame of reference for that kind of journey. 
Um, and I'm gonna, because I'm gonna be the first in my immediate family to get a PhD um, in science. So I really appreciate their flexibility and extending me support um, and empathy when they don't really understand much about what I do. Um, because I really <laughs> repeatedly fail to communicate what I do to them in a relatable way. Um, <laughs> a note for you all, don't use the word coalescence at the dinner table. <laughs> but uh, at least I know um, that they know enough about it to get some real zingers in about me being a career student forever. <laughs> um, and I just want to acknowledge in particular my sister right here, Ryan. Um, she has also been chasing her own dreams on a divergent path, um, kind of parallel to me, but in a very opposite direction. And she's been a real role model and a source of solidarity um, about taking a divergent path that often feels lonely. Um, and maybe one day soon I'll let her tattoo me. Um, definitely not with the um, manatee mermaid hybrid that I <laughs> <laughs> that she tried to offer to me last time. <laughs> And I especially want to thank my um, papa. He passed away this last year, um, but he made following my dreams possible by helping put me through college. Um, and he's kind, the kind of like generous dream chaser that I try to remind myself to be um, when I'm feeling particularly pessimistic. I miss you, Papa, and I wish we could have had met at my graduation ceremony again. Um, but your generosity has really impacted my life in a way that I'll never forget. All right. Next on to my academic parent. Um, uh, my advisor, uh, Fish, Fish Chris Martin, um, is been quite literally a coast to coast journey these last six years. And um, I came into his lab with a background in mainly statistical phylogenetics and not having worked with live animals at all. Um, and he says that I was a real lover of fish, um, but when I met him, I was like, oh, I'm not a lover of fish and this, is this guy is. But his infectious enthusiasm um, for fish was really hard not to catch on to. And so I first want to thank him for encouraging a deeper love of fish in me, um, and especially a love of ones doing absolute bonkers things out there. And um, Chris guided me through some of my first fieldwork experiences, as he talked about. Um, and I maybe looked like I was smiling in that picture, but I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> um, so for a homebody, I never felt any shame um, not having this experience before starting lab. And I think that's um, something that is really special and I want to make sure um, I have for my students moving forward too. And for all Chris's crazy stories about his field work, um, like disappearing into the wild for what seemed like days and getting chased by wild pigs, um, <laughs> he was willing to accommodate me not being up to crazy bushwhacking adventures. Um, although he did convince me into an admittedly awesome all day ex escapade on a nearby island in which we took this four seater plane um, that was piloted by a name, man named Manfred, who I'll never forget, but he's very known to show up um, with him to the, like, the airport to his plane with like 20 dogs, and you're like, are those dogs coming with us? <laughs> but but um, surprisingly, though, Chris was actually not the craziest person on that trip to me, but more on that soon. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for sharing pieces of your personal life with me, too. Um, I love getting to see and hear about your girls um, and seeing how important your family is to you. And it means a lot to me that you shared them with us, um, even giving us some of their really cute artwork. <laughs> the pup fish. Um, and I can tell how much you would like how much um, the how much the girls mean to you. Um, and it would really make me smile to like walk in the fish room and see that like higher class you had written little <laughs> things, uh, doodles on the fish tanks. Um, and so thanks. Um, for supplying me also with all the fish decor in my office. <laughs> um, they're definitely coming with me into my future ones. And next I wanna thank the fish. And so um, I'm not much of a, like the best naturalist and odds are if you ask me to identify a particular like fish out there, I'm not gonna be able to do it. But um, having fish in the lab has really instilled a real love of fish in me, um, mainly for all the kind of cute, silly things that they're doing. So this is Noodle, the pet lungfish. Um, and Noodle is just a ham and can't actually eat. <laughs> like you'll see him miss all the time. <laughs> and he oftentimes misses and then falls over. Um, and you can keep watching that, but I'm gonna start with some of the other. The pupfish too are known to be goofballs. They really enjoy sometimes not mating with the female that Michelle wants to put them with, but with bubbles. <laughs> so he even chases the female away. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, give me my bubbles. 
<laughs> and then if you didn't know, um, fish actually like laser pointers too. So here's some cichlids from the lab. Um, and I'm gonna put a laser pointer down and they're all gonna start chasing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so I found that a really, um, I think the kind of overlap that I share with all of you for love of animals um, spans all taxonomic borders. You just gotta show me something doing something. <laughs> name it but um so yeah so like here's those videos that i really love um but um i want to go back to that comment that chris wasn't the craziest one on this remote island trip joe oh joe oh joe <laughs> um, joe was the first grad student in the lab um and he didn't move to berkeley with us um but he's been and always will be a really integral part of the lab to me um, Joe led the way into pupfish genetics, so it was really nice having um, someone there to rely on um, on that front. And I've always admired Joe for his really effortless ability to blend and transition between being absolutely purely silly. Um, and so this is like only a tiny small fraction of him being silly. It gets a lot crazier than that. But um, I especially just want to, um, so being really silly and then instantly switching to being very smart and insightful. Um, I especially want to thank him for all the moments in which he shared with me his wonder for all that we've been accomplishing in science and all of us, all the work that us grad students had done so far and bringing me along for that moment of awe. Um, even though we were often quite a little bit tipsy when those moments came out. <laughs> <laughs> and next I want to do the unfair thing of lumping the rest of the lab together um, on one slide. If any of you want individual kudos, please come find me after. Um, but the, the graduate students, postdocs, and techs in the lab have been a phenomenal support system, especially in a pandemic environment um, that really taxed all of our support systems. We had so many fun lab hangouts, like playing code names, and our time was really cut in half, it seems, by social distancing, though. And that's a fact that I'm really struggling to grapple with, um, given my really soon departure. Um, but you've always all made me laugh at the lab meetings, happy hours, and over Slack. And you've made the lab community so special to me. I really hope my own lab group one day has a very similar dynamic to what we have. Um, and next, I want to thank um, two undergraduates. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to thank Priya. Sorry. Sorry. Um, thanks to Priya and the Morjani Lab. Um, they've included me in a lot of their lab meetings. And I really enjoyed um, every single meeting I've gone to. And they've been a really big role model for me um, in that they've shown me kind of what it looks like when you find a lot of strength and joy in um, ripping results apart. And that sounds bad, but um, let me rephrase that. In that I really admire just how they all eagerly pull apart and dissect every, every evolutionary inference, um, but they do it in a way that really highlights um, and celebrates the progress the field keeps making um, towards um, answering and addressing these really nigh impossible um, answer, like, uh, answers that we're seeking. And so I hope to keep a very similar mindset um, moving forward in my own attempts to solve my own evolutionary mysteries. And then, Where's this going? Oh, sorry. Um, and then here I want to thank, um, I, ooh, I did this so out of order, <laughs> but um, I just want to acknowledge all the fun I've had doing outreach and community activities with Sylvia, Jackie, and Daisy. Michelle was there too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you've all given the NBZ community some extra pizzazz in my eyes. Um, and I thank you for trying to include me um, as a fourth year grad student who was trying to masquerade as a first year as all of you. <laughs> um, and so next I want to just thank my two undergrads that I worked with. Um, they were absolute delights to work with. And um, like, sorry, Ana Yi and Takao, um, I was so impressed by all that they accomplished, especially in the pandemic. Um, and they give me a glimpse of what it could be like as a professor and just remind me how powerful the simple act of just um, getting to share yourself with the people is and how it can be a great motivator for doing science. Um, I think about them a lot and I hope they've learned even a fraction of the things from me as I learned from them. I'm so proud of them for chasing their dreams. Um, Ana E is going to go to grad school in Texas and Takao is applying to um, that's major or master programs right now. Okay. Getting revenge for the corn hat picture because it's actually Mallory's corn hat picture. Um, but I just want to say thanks to Mallory and Molly. Um, 
to Molly, I really enjoyed be getting an inside look um, through you at what it's like just over the hill, um, starting your own lab. I aspire to be as compassionate an advisor who loves what they do and can make anyone feel welcome in their presence as you do. Um, you've done a lot of those things for me during the pandemic period, and um, <laughs> I've almost made it. <laughs> that was the side that you made me cry, Molly. You just remember that. <laughs> Um, and it was decidedly hard in a period of time that it was decidedly hard for anyone to feel welcome anywhere outside their house. Um, you and Valerie made Berkeley feel like a home and I'm not that sad that we didn't have a lot of time to overlap here because there will be plenty more visits in the future. And thanks for keeping me supplied in dog photos. Mm -hmm. um, and to Mallory, um, thanks for enlightening me in the ways of plasticity in the environment, even though I completely ignored that in my talk today. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks for introducing Introducing me to talk about Cantina. My lab will tell you that I never shut up about it. <laughs> but um, we've always been, you've always been a really solid, safe space to talk about like life and science. And it's not always easy to find that. Um, even though you say I love you and good to see you again, <laughs> very sarcastically all the time, those statements have always been true on my end. Um, and now thanks to your talk acknowledgements from last week that have definitely been recorded on YouTube. I know it's true from your end as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And lastly, I want to thank someone extremely close to my heart. Um, she's been a close companion ever since I met her at the beginning of my PhD. We've literally traveled across the country together. She has a thing for fish. She loves a good science chat. And I don't know what I would have done without her. We even share a middle name. Um, and everyone, please give it up for Tonks. <laughs> 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 but jokes aside, another equally important <laughs> person important to me is Michelle and Emily St. John. Um, there are too many things to say about Michelle, and she can't for the life of her take a compliment from me, but, but here goes. Um, I've never met a more whip smart, funny, creative, and generous being. Um, I don't say that in a that kind of idealized way um, when we can sometimes idolize people by from afar because um, Michelle and I have been up close and personal for years. Um, you literally can't tell where her desk ends and mine begins, I'll say, but I think it's because she's encroaching on my territory. <laughs> um, but Michelle has taught me almost too much <laughs> about fish stats and friendship. Um, she's seen me at my best and worst and she's seen me cry a lot. <laughs> but um, and it's like something about a single word or look from her just like sends me into tears. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, she acknowledges and sits with all the emotions and words that tumble out of me. Well, except for the fact that I want us to celebrate like graduate, like our graduation at Chili's. Um, she's cruelly rejected that one. So I enjoy very much being supported and pushed and laughing and stressing out with her. Just doing anything. Um, and I didn't know science could be so fun until I started working with Michelle, and I don't know where I'd be in my pursuit of science without her support. Um, besides being my best friend in science, um, Michelle has been a really big role model to me when I think about the kind of scientist I'd like to be. She's very empathetic to anyone who needs to be heard, um, yet is still inspiringly steadfast in her values. Um, she's aspirationally courageous in her willingness to speak up. And she speaks up a lot, <laughs> and I'm sure you've heard her do so at community <laughs> meetings. Um, but when Michelle does speak up, she is also very willing to do the work and aids in the efforts she cares about. And I hope she continues to rub off on me in that way as her careers progress. Uh, Michelle is an excellent mentor and friend, and there's no one I'd rather do science with. And I look forward to working with you in the future, even if we don't sit next to each other on the daily. And I'm actually looking forward to not getting your heater blasted at me. <laughs> but I don't know what I'll do without you in the, in the few months. Um, you know I lock myself out a lot, so I won't be able to rescue me anymore. <laughs> and that's that's the end. Oh, I forgot to show you my favorite pictures of Michelle. But, but yeah, these are some fun photos. Then I just generally wanted to thank everyone here um, as a MVZ community. Um, You've all made this journey kind of great for me, and um, I've just enjoyed all the moments, happy and small, or big and small, um, all of them happy. Um, and so uh, Michelle and I have a tradition of happiness notes, and a lot of these feature a lot of people in the, the MVC. So I'll leave this up later for you to check out. It's probably too small to read, but I want to thank you all for being so great. And that's it. <laughs>
happy to take any questions. <laughs> yeah. How are these pupfish getting around? Um, <laughs> so I think it's mainly been, it's, let's see. Um, so like, I think it's been both like in the kind of past. So like when sea levels were much lower about 10 to 20,000 years ago, the um, most of the islands in the Bahamas actually sat on a single like kind of Grand Bahama bank that just like underlying it. And so there's a lot more coastlines to go around. Um, but an interesting thing is that we do see some signs of more recent um, colonization of pupfish um, through more of the kind of like, um, I don't know what, what you call Pigeon Creek, like an estuary, um, but we see more recent signs of um, pupfish coming as well um, post the colonization of San Salvador Island. Um, so either maybe they're being swept around by high currents, um, that gyre um, in the, the Pacific is actually like right there. Uh, not Pacific, sorry, Atlantic um, is right next to San Salvador Island too. So they could be getting pushed around and they can survive um, a lot of different salinities too. Or maybe a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. That was a great talk. If, if you go to uh, a lake where all you see are the generalists mm -hmm. and, and you ask, uh, how often do they eat snails or snails? Do you have any sense of that? The just generalists? Yeah. Um, I don't know if we focus so much on the ones where they overlap, but I think just based on even where they do experience some gene flow um, in sympathy with these guys, um, we only find like 0.001% of their diet is like a scale. So it seems more incidental, but I don't know um, if we've actually measured scales in the guts of generalists only. I actually know that's not true. I think Chris has, and I just don't know that number, but it's in that uh, cryptic origins paper, I think. But, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think if it is, it's more like incidental ingestion. Um, it seems to be really quite low. And we definitely didn't see it. Like for one example, we see an island um, uh, called New Providence Island that has some diversity in phenotypes, especially they have like slightly enlarged oral jaws. Um, and some undergraduates dissected their gut contents and found those scales. I guess I'm just, you know, you emphasize genetic contingency, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering um, just more about the ecology, if there's some sort of ecological contingency. Oh, yeah. Um, there might be. Uh, I think like something about, I remember like, um, uh, Najee's talk just reminded me how much more of a maybe a bigger black box uh, ecology is, um, and it might be in the system. At the very least, uh, everything that we've measured seems to be pretty similar across the islands, except for um, kind of like one or two species of macroalgae. But yeah, there's a lot about the ecology that I don't think we've explored. Yeah. So. Great talk. Um, the adapt this adapter radiation is so young, and mm -hmm. so it makes me wonder, like, how ephemeral these sorts of things oh, are, yeah. and whether these species like this come and go. Yeah. And whether or not there might be any sort of like maybe in these other populations where mm -hmm. you don't see them, maybe they were there at times, mm -hmm. and we're just in this time window they're yeah. not available. But I'm wondering if there's any sort of signature in the genome of the generalist that might tell you whether or not they've coexisted with these others with other lineages like this, if they yeah. existed at some point in the past that you could look for? Yeah, that is a great question. And I keep trying to figure out how to tell if I, when I've seen sort of that like collapse. Um, a lot of the literature that I keep looking at when I'm like, oh, they got them in a class species, they like know previously that they've seen them. Um, but it is great because like also those, or the ones I was just talking about on this other island that have some phenotypic diversity, I've always wondered if they are like a collapse radiation. Mm -hmm. um, but if anyone has any ideas about how to tell them that, it'd be awesome. Um, there might be some signature with um, uh, like nucleotide diversity, but I don't know quite what I've looked for. Maybe like signs of selection, but I think it might end up being that like, um, if it has in the past, it's probably not that really strong signature of selection that I can do, that I like uh, can only detect with the kind of sequencing we've done. It's really, it's something that I want to kind of investigate a little bit more in the future. Great question. Chris Kozak has a stand up. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, hi. So um, I had a question about your um, admixture analysis. This may be a little technical, but I'm always curious how people choose um, the software to use. In this case, you had three mix versus QP admix and different number of individuals, and they, you know, the patterns looked a little different. So I'm just curious, what what is the difference between them, and how did you choose? And, yeah. yeah um, that's a great question, and I remember this from like a year ago. <laughs> um, but there was something about QP graph. Um, could detect, uh, shoot, they could detect something that was very different um, that tree makes can miss. And I honestly can't quite remember it off the top of my head. Um, but I'm also happy to look that up and respond to you via email if you want. Um, and the, the populations being different um, was largely because I did the QP graph um, with the, the wide mouse in mind. Um, and so I had just redone it. And because I knew that there was some ability of QP graph to detect something um, that I was uh, wondering if I was missing that I just had done um, the, the, the populations only. So the tree mix graph was actually across all lakes for the, the one that I showed at least was across all lakes on San Salvador. So like the scale leaders from every single pond that we had sequenced versus the QP graph was just the particular lake in which we sequenced all four species. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll I'll have a detailed look <laughs> at your paper and maybe then we can have a chat on, on yeah. what's happening. Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, sorry I couldn't remember what exactly was different, but there is something different. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, it's a selfish question. What, are there is there any like uh, phenotypic diversity in the cow farm in North Carolina since all that introduction into the wide mouse is coming from there? Um he did find, let's see, I might have that. I do have that graph somewhere. Um, I think he could, so like what he did was just like use uh, like clustering statistics to try to like see if there was some divergence in phenotypes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, oh yeah, we, sorry, we didn't actually, in the phenotype data, I forgot, we didn't do North Carolina. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there are interestingly other islands, like not in these two traits, but like Ackland, is another island in the, the Bahamas that seems to have a lot of like diversity divergence going on, mm -hmm. um, but I've never quite went back and looked at it. Okay, well, let's thank and congratulate everyone. <laughs>